Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our complimentary webinar series for US federal government contractors. We're coming to you live from Washington, DC today. This webinar series will, will run for 15 weeks or 15 Wednesdays as we cover subcontracting opportunities within each of the 15 federal departments. As usual, all webinars are complimentary, so you can find the schedule, registration links, and recordings on our website under the subcontracting section. Our data partner each week is GovSpend, formerly FedMine, and our legal perspective will be covered by a rotating government contracts attorney each Wednesday. And a little bit about us, as you can see on the slide, we provide the following services for federal contractors, including product, service, and software firms across the globe. You can find more information about us on our website. Our webinars and newsletters reach a vast array of federal contractors, and our YouTube channel now has almost 600 complimentary webinars. So please follow our channel and then give our videos a like or a comment. We also offer advertising opportunities, including in this series right now, um, if your organization is interested in reaching federal contractors. You can sponsor an event, our webinars, advertise in our newsletter, or have us post your promotional information on LinkedIn. Contact us at hello at jennifershouse.com for pricing and our media kit. And also we've added another procurement playbook webinar on doing business with the NSA. Um, this was originally rescheduled. Um, so this is a live webinar. We will not be recording this webinar. It will be Friday, October 21st at 12 p.m. The government speaker will be taking audience questions during this webinar. So um, it's such a great opportunity and we really hope that you can join us. And now we'd like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsors um, who help make this series possible. A special thanks to Tom Johnson and the team at Set Aside Alert for posting this webinar series in their newsletter. Please visit setasidealert.com to learn more about their services for small businesses. Additionally, we'd like to thank Gov Events and also Fairfax County for sharing this webinar series on their public calendars please visit their websites and calendars for other related events. And we'd like to thank the Virginia PTAC. Virginia PTAC is based out of GMU in Fairfax and offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling um, on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on your business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to contact the PTAC. And also a quick thanks to our friends at BidSpeed. The BidSpeed platform helps you win and increase your probability of winning government contracts. They have opportunities from every federal, state, and local public source in the United States. If you're looking for a compliance matrix, a proposal template, a strategic teaming partner, or details on an, on an expiring contract, BidSpeed can help. BidSpeed is an official partner of the SBA's 7J Management and Technical Assistance Program. Contact BidSpeed at the email or phone number here to learn more. And thank you to Gov White Papers, an online resource for content. Gov White Papers is a free knowledge hub for the public sector and supporting industries to find, post, and promote government and military related content. Explore B2G advertising solutions with our team of expert government marketers so you can connect with public sector decision makers. Promotional opportunities include lead generation, display ads, white label content creation, email marketing, and more. Browse thousands of free white papers, eBooks, case studies, and more to stay informed on topics like defense, economy, healthcare, technology, supply chain, and education. Plus, upload your content for free to boost website traffic and exposure in the government community. Join Gov White Papers today to get started. And today's webinar is sponsored in part by Cal Technology IT Consulting, Cal Technology helping business take their software to the next level. With over 20 years of experience working with federal contractors on large scale systems from ship control to cloud, Cal Technology understands the challenge of a constantly evolving technical environment while maintaining legacy capabilities. Please see www.cal.technology or email contact at cal.technology or call 
2218 for more information. And that information is right there on your screen as well. And we'd also like to thank C3. C3 Integrated Solutions is a full service IT provider <clears throat> that specializes in securing our nation's defense industrial base through cloud-based solutions and industry leading partners. C3 is a provider of Microsoft government cloud solutions, including Office 365, GCC, GCC High, and Azure Gov, and specializes in helping clients achieve CMMC and NIST 800-171 compliance by providing MSP security and Office 365 integration services. No matter where you are on your compliance journey, C3 can help. Get compliant and stay compliant with C3 integrated solutions. All right, so today we are here to dig into the subcontracting opportunities at the Department of Defense. So let's just take a quick look at our agenda for today. Um, as you can see, we're going to start with panelist introductions and close out with legal insights. So our first panelist today is Ms. Archisa Meehan. She's representing GovSpend. GovSpend is the go-to resource for finding federal contracting opportunities. Please contact Archisa for more information about the GovSpend platform. So thank you, Archisa, for being with us as always. All right. And our next panelist, our legal speaker for today, is Ms. Jody Reed. Um, and she's from the law firm McMahon, Walsh and Leonard, PLLC. Thank you, Jody, for being with us. Good morning. Or afternoon, I guess, really now. Ah, I guess it is now, huh? All right. So um, first, before Archisa goes through um, our top five vendors, we're going to kick it off with a mission statement from the Department of Defense. So um, you can read it there. The mission of the Department of Defense is to provide the military forces needed to deter war and ensure our nation's security. Um, so it's always important, like we always say, um, to keep that mission statement in mind um, as you're trying to um, do work with this department. And you can see here um, the various agencies and services within the department. We encourage you to spend um, more time with each of these services' websites to learn more about their specific missions. Um, as you can see, this is a very long list, longer than um, the other departments that we've covered so far because Department of Defense is such a large um, department. So make sure you take a look at that. Um, and as always, here are just some important links providing information um, on, you can find the link to the main department website, um, as well as to the small business office. Um, and then the procurement forecast to understand what the department is buying, when they're buying it, how much they're buying, and if any specific set aside or contract vehicle may be used. Um, and then lastly, there's the link to the SBA scorecard, um, which can help you understand the small business contracting trends and what dollars are being won by women, veterans, hub zone firms, and other disadvantaged businesses. So let's take a look at the top 10 vendors for the Department of Defense. Um, I won't read these off to you because our chief is gonna go through the top five very soon, um, but this is just a quick look. So now we're going to go through the top five in more detail. Um, Archie, so I'll hand it over to you now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, and I couldn't introduce myself, but my name is Archie Shamihan, and uh, I come from FedMind GovSpan, and we basically integrate federal contract data into an easy-to-use manner. Uh, the first company that we're going to look at is Lockheed Martin. Now, I want everyone to remember that Lockheed Martin is huge and when we look at and we present the contract data we are looking maybe at a parent profile it does not necessarily have everything flow in there but um, I think in this case um, we just focused on DOD for Lockheed so um, let's go to the next slide um, here is the link which uh, to for the small business office at uh, Lockheed Martin. Um, next slide. So uh, what we did was we said we want to see what what is what are all the contracts that Lockheed's won at DoD. 
Uh, DOD, as you know, includes all of the major agencies, um, uh, including what we call DOD with the separate contract um, contracting office agency ID number, but it also includes DLA, Army, Air Force, and Navy. So the last fiscal year for Lockheed, the Navy and Air Force definitely were their top clients. Um, if I'm looking at the NICS codes, again, no surprises with aircraft manufacturing, um, space vehicle manufacturing, navigation, aircraft parts, uh, engineering services, all part of the top NICS that Lockheed is getting contracts in at DOD. Um, next slide. Um, further looking in at some of the subcontracts that Lockheed has worked with, um, you could see for sure that, uh, you know, wherever that data is made public in um, USA spending um, that gets it from FSRS, you could actually go in and see that, um, you know, Lockheed, as an example for year to date, has awarded more than $14 billion as subcontract um, to more than th almost 3,000 companies. Um, and then this uh, the screen is also showing you quickly, you know, the types of um, data that is available as you are planning your strategy, as you're trying to create, um, as you are deciding whether you want to reach out to these companies. Um, always, you know, the reason why we are showing you the data is to make sure that um, we go with full knowledge of what that company is doing. And that way it helps us have a much better discussion with the small business offices. Um, so next slide. Um, so this was, yes, uh, this was looking at subcontracts for Lockheed at DOD uh, for FY21. Um, again, um, more than 3,000 odd sub awardees and more than 100 odd billion dollars that were awarded. Now do keep in mind, um, you know, this is um, looking at the data that is made public. It is some many times self-reported. Um, so always like to put in that, that little disclaimer. Uh, next slide. And then this is further looking more at the subcontractors, uh, subcontracts at Lockheed for DOD uh, for FY21. In terms of the next codes that the subcontracts were awarded in, you know, we have shipbuilding, R&D, aircraft manufacturing, um, looking at uh, the companies that are winning the contracts, um, you know, you will see companies like the large uh, defense contractors, including the Northrop Grumman's and Raytheon's as subcontractors, but you will also see some other companies like Aeroglan or uh, Marinette Marine Corporation. So um, always interesting to see that. Um, I would always recommend to use keyword searches, next code searches to get more visibility and understanding who are the subcontractors that um, Lockheed or any of the top primes are working with. Um, you know, what is the price? Uh, uh, what is that prime contract? Who are the other primes that Lockheed is working with at, on that prime contract too? Um, so next slide. So the next slide takes us to um, Humana. Um, next slide. Um, this is the link to uh, register um, uh, and un learn more about the small business office at Humana. Uh, next slide. So um, for Humana, their largest client is the Defense Health Agency. Um, and just to show you in terms of the top NICS codes, um, you know, the direct health and medical insurance carrier NICS codes as also administrative services are the top uh, NICS codes that are being used. Um, next slide. And in terms of the contracts, uh, we know what is the type of work that Humana is getting? It's really for managed care support services um, at DHA as you can see that, which is the contracting and funding office. Um, what you can also see on the screen is some of the subcontractors that have been reported on this uh, contract, um, which includes uh, a pretty nice mix of companies and the type of work that they do, whether we're looking at companies such as a leapfrog group or um, you know, printing companies, and um, it just seems like a nice mix of companies that 
um, Humana is working with for its subcontracts. Um, next slide. And these are the subcontracts that were reported, um, you know, and so you could see that the Wisconsin Physician Service Insurance Corporation is the largest subcontractor, um, uh, as is uh, Rethink Autism. Uh, so um, always good to get that visibility. Of course, you would then get more details on, you know, when was that contract awarded, when does it end, things of that information. So um, next slide, then we get on to the next company which is General Dynamics. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, again, um, here is the link for uh, understanding and doing business with uh, General Dynamics. Um, just quick look, um, you know, more than um, six uh, odd billion dollars, um, Army, Navy, Air Force are your top, uh, but especially for the specific um, division, uh, Army is your top uh, company. Next slide. Um, looking at the various NAICS codes, uh, you could see that, uh, you know, military armored vehicles, engineering services, ammunition, are all your top NAICS codes that contracts are being awarded under. And in terms of place of performance, definitely Michigan, Massachusetts, and Virginia are very much on top there. Uh, next slide. Um, so here is a quick look at, um, you know, getting uh, understanding what's happening at the specific organization, the specific SAM UEI that's, uh, you know, came up. Um, you have the ability to also go in and see uh, the subcontracts and um, a GAO protests as you're trying to understand a company, as you reach out to them to create those relationships. I think getting a very clear understanding is super important so next slide um, and then i wanted to quickly touch on some of the subcontracts that they have awarded uh, this is an fy21 um, and uh, again this is self-reported uh, so i do want us to keep that in mind but the next codes are shipbuilding military armored vehicles engineering services and you could see in terms of the top award, top uh, sub awardees, we have H Welding, uh, Brewer Crane, American Scaffold. So again, a nice mix of companies. But it's always interesting to see that you know when we look at the top, it's it's going to be really based on what the top contracts are. But as you add on the next codes and the keywords, uh, the results sets really start changing, and it's um, it's it gives us a lot of deep insights that help us plan our strategies of subcontracting. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the things before we get into the next company that I always like to point out is that um, when, when prime contracts are awarded, um, most agencies will, you know, have the subcontract plans and things in place. Um, when a prime contract is awarded, many, many instances, we'll actually see that there is a, a subcontract plan requirement. A lot of times, um, you know, companies will use that as a search criteria along with keywords and next code to get a better understanding of which specific contracts actually have a subcontract requirement. So keep that in mind. Um, next company is Boeing. Uh, next slide. Um, here is the link for registering as a supplier for Boeing. Next slide. Um, quick look at uh, the top contracts um, for DOD. Um, and then uh, let's, and when you see that 44 companies, it's really telling you there are 44 separate entities of Boeing, separate SAM UEIs that have won those contracts. Um, next slide. Um, no surprises, aircraft manufacturing is the main um, NAICS code along with uh, related NAICS codes. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, here is a list of actually some of the subcontracts that Boeing has received that has been reported. Um, again, you will see the, uh, Boeing, but that's a separate DUNS number or a SAMU EI. Uh, but you will see companies like KN Associates and Mantec and Northrop and Lockheed, 
all as sub as um, companies um, as as uh, companies that Boeing is doing work with. Um, next slide. Uh, this is a look at the subcontracts that Boeing has awarded. Um, again, uh, you know, you could quickly see the NAICS codes, but also the companies that Boeing has awarded uh, subcontracts to, which includes, um, you know, the University of Alabama Huntsville Foundation or um, a lot of the other larger companies too that it's one con subcontract with. So let's go to the next slide. And the last company that we're going to talk a little bit about is HealthNet or um, HealthNet Federal Services. Uh, <clears throat> the link to register as a small business vendor. Um, next slide. And um, this one was, um, you know, they, DOD is their largest client. They have done some work for uh, Department of Veterans Affairs earlier. Um, you do see whenever you see a negative uh, number, it, it tells you there's a de-obligation many times. It just could be um, contract close out, um, but uh, you know, that information is definitely there. Um, next, and, and again, in terms of the NAICS codes, it's the direct health and medical insurance carrier NAICS code. Uh, next slide. Um, this is what the program or the work that HealthNet is doing. It's really for managed care support services for the TRICARE program for the West Region at DHA. Um, next slide. And I think that was all for um, HealthNet. So thank you so much. And uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Archisa, for um, all the great data and your insights and, of course, your time. It's always great to have you with us. Um, now I'm going to quickly run through some marketing best practices. Um, we've listed them here for you. Most importantly, you should use the tools available on SAM.gov or the GovSpend platform to conduct uh, research on the primes and expiring contracts, use the primes website, their newsletter and events calendars, as well as social media to learn more about them. Um, it's really important that you do this background research before you begin connecting um, with these companies. Lastly, set yourself apart um, and lead with your capabilities, not your socioeconomic status. Bring a specific opportunity to the prime and work with the SBLOs, the small business liaison officers. They're your advocates, so um, make sure that you're working with them. All right, and now um, we'll go over to legal considerations and best practices. Please note that we have covered the federal acquisition regulation on the department earlier this year, so you can find the um, YouTube recording there on the screen. Um, you'll, you can also access it on our website, um, just on our YouTube channel in general, but I'll also send out these slides after the webinar today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, hand it over to Jody Reed. Thank you, Jody, for joining us. Next slide, please. So first of all, before I get started, I have to give the caveat that I'm not providing legal advice. Um, and if you do want legal advice, uh, please do contact us. We provide a broad range of pretty much cradle to grave, anything on government contracting up to and including um, acquisition. We have a good organization here that does a lot of uh, uh, gov uh, com um, oh, purchasing and selling of companies. Um, I do a lot of work also with compliance. I do advise also on when we talk about compliance also in areas of compliance with the various cybersecurity requirements. Um, and that kind of leads me into the first one here. And this sounds kind of obvious, but read your subcontract. I can't tell you how often, both when I was in-house counsel as well now as I'm working back at a law firm, where I would get a question from a client um, whether it was an internal or an external client, and say, hey, the government tells me I have to do A, B, C, and my first question is, is well, what does the contract say? And the response I get is one of twofold, either one, I have no clue, or two, we don't even know where the contract is, which is also a little disconcerting as an attorney. But the bottom line is, when you get a contract, you should read it. If there's something you don't understand, the government is 
is very happy to explain it to you. And even if you're in a competition, one of the things that can happen is, is you can go back and ask questions. If you're dealing with a prime, the, it's even easier. Talk to the prime contractors. Um, they're, they're, they may not always have the best answer, but at least they have an answer of how they believe that it's going to be interpreted. Don't presume an interpretation based on something you did in the past. And I, I really literally cannot reiterate enough, read the subcontract. Um, it's going to have stuff there that may not be applicable to you. So the easiest thing for a subcontract manager from any of the prime contractors to do is to take the prime contract and flow everything down to the subcontractor, up to including a full statement of work, which rarely, sometimes, but rarely does a subcontractor have work under each aspect of a statement of work. So it's, it's just not appropriate and you need to push back and you need to negotiate. Next slide. Right up there, negotiate your subcontract. Generally, there's three areas of concern. Protection of intellectual property, and I'm gonna do one of my pet peeves right now. Um, I look at a lot of subcontract agreements for clients. Um, I look at a lot of subcontract agreements for some of those companies that were just mentioned up above. And one of the things that I have noticed more and more is that the prime contractors put language in there that says that this subcontract, and it's a term of art, is a work for hire. And what that means is, is that all the work you do, they will own, not the government, even though it's coming from government funding, it's them. And according to the law, again, it seems like a silly thing to have to mention this, but according to the law, there's something called the Buy Dole Act. It's, B, it's from Birch Buy and Robert Dole. It went into play, uh, especially for small businesses, and now it's applicable to everybody. Um, back in the early 70s. And what that fundamentally says is that if a contractor is given money to do design work or to work for the federal government or create something for the federal government, we're talking about the area of intellectual property, the, the organization that creates it owns it. Is that something you can negotiate away? Of course it is. And the prime contractors these days more and more are relying upon the fact that their subcontractors don't know better. And I, I don't know how else to say that to the point that I've literally gotten into conversations, almost arguments with subcontractors who basically say, no, they told me I had to give it, that I had to give them all the intellectual property. I had to turn it over to them. I'm like, well, that's not in accordance with the law. The law says you own it. They need to have what's called a license to do whatever they need to do with that to satisfy their prime contract. And the government gets what's called an unlimited license. And then there's something also, they only get that unlimited license if you actually deliver it. So that's the other piece of protection. If you don't deliver something, it doesn't matter that somebody has some sort of license rights. They don't have it so that they can't use it. And that's something that's called inchoate rights, which is basically you have a right to something, but you can't perfect it because you don't have ownership. So when you're looking at, the, at intellectual property, there's kind of two aspects of it. One, make sure you have the appropriate FAR and DFAR clauses. And it's either going to be 52 dot, well, it's, we're talking defense. So it's going to be 252 dot two two seven dash seven oh one three seven oh one four um if you're doing a cyber program i believe that one's seven oh one nine and the other piece of it is if you bring intellectual property to the table make sure that before you give any of that intellectual property to the prime contractor or to the government that you've included you your contract actually lists all the intellectual property that the government is going to get with what's called less than unlimited rights. And the final piece of that when we're talking about intellectual property is that if you you have a commercial product, and we'll talk about that in a second, the license that you have when you sell your commercial product is the license that goes along with your product. The government doesn't get restricted rights to that. They get the license right that's part of that. 
Now, there's some aspects of most licenses, which I'm not going to get into, that the government won't accept. So most companies who sell to the commercial stuff to the federal government usually will have what they call a government addendum, which changes some of the things. For example, as a license that you sell commercially, it will, it will probably have some state law as being applicable. Federal government's not going to accept any state law. The next piece of this is cost, cost accounting, and pricing requirements. If you're a small business and you don't have a way to allocate and charge costs to each individual project, then one of the things you can't do is accept a whole bunch of cost and cost accounting requirements because you have no way to, to implement those. So in those cases, you really do need to have fixed price contracts. They will try and flow down cost accounting standards. Well, that's because they cost accounting standards are going to be applicable to them. But the average small business, the cost accounting standards are not applicable. And given how much work is involved with keeping cost accounting standards and disclosure statements, you want to avoid those for as long as you can. Now, obviously, if you're a Northrop Grumman or something like that, they are applicable and they're going to be flowed down. And finally, just flow down requirements in general. Um, I I was recently looking at a major defense contractor subcontract, and they had attached to it the DOD flow down uh, um, DFARS flow down provisions. They had the flow down provisions from the FAA, and they had the flow down provisions from one other um, um, agency of the government. And my pushback was, well, you can't just throw all these in here and just say they're applicable if they're applicable when you don't even tell us if they're applicable. So make sure and they, they agreed and they actually it was a DOD contract that the prime was. So they removed all the other ones. But had we not pushed back, all of those potentially could have been part of our contract and we would not have known what was actually applicable to our contract because it just wasn't stated anywhere. Next slide. Um, I probably talked a lot about the IP portfolio, but that's one of the things. If you, two things. One, if you've created intellectual property at your own expense, and by own expense means it comes from any indirect cost pool or from profit, then the government is actually not entitled to any rights to that except what you may give them under a subsequent contract. Um, I just recently taught um, I do some teaching for Fed pubs, and I was recently out there teaching the course on other transaction agreements. And one of the people in there came in and said, "Yeah, we created this software program that was a really big reason why we um, we would win a lot of contracts. And we did it under our, one of our GNA pools. And the government came in and said, "Oh well, we own that now, so you have to give it to us.'" And they did. When in fact, either the person that told them that flat out lied, which unfortunately does happen. Or the person just didn't understand how the law works. And now she made the, the person made the comment that they're not winning the contracts anymore because basically the government gave that to all of their the program to all their competitors. And so even though it was their money that created this because they ended up giving it to the government, even though they didn't have to, they now have lost a very huge competitive um, advantage. In the DFARS, you actually have three levels of intellectual property. Under the FAR, there's only two. Under the DFARS, you have unlimited rights, government purpose rights, and then limited slash restricted rights. And it's a, is that a click? Under the FAR, government purpose rights goes away. So if you have a FAR-based contract, you only are going to have unlimited and limited slash restricted. The differences are... Un unlimited, the government pays 100% for the development and you've delivered it. Government purpose rights means that it's money, it's mixed money. And then limited slash restricted means that it's all private funding. And to understand kind of the distinction between, say, for example, how you can have something that you're delivering to the government remain limited and not fall into government purpose rights, I kind of lose this, this, this analogy. When you have, when you make vegetable soup, you can actually pick out all the individual pieces of vegetable. You can have the carrots, the potatoes, the turnips, the broth. It can all be separated out. 
And as long as you can segregate all those pieces out, you can claim limited rights for those pieces that you created or a company creates at private expense. But if I then take that soup, which I have been doing over the last few years, because it's really, really nice in the winter time, and dump it into my Vitamix and blend it all up together so that I can no longer pick out the carrots or strain the liquid out or something like that, then the government's going to, by law, this is by statute, get government purpose rights. So when you're developing your stuff and when you're providing your stuff, one of the things you want to do as much as possible is keep things under category three there and not under category one or two. And again, I cannot reiterate this enough. The prime contractor is not entitled to own the IP a subcontractor creates pursuant to a government funded contract. They say otherwise, and I, I've talked to enough, uh, I, I have literally talked to enough um, subcontracts people to know that they will use that argument and say you're wrong. And what ends up happening ultimately is we end up having to go up to the, the attorneys and the attorneys say, yeah, subcontracts guy, nice try, but no, that's not the way the law works. Um, so value add, whether you call us or you call some other attorney, is when you get that pushback, and, and you will get that pushback. Um, that's when the attorneys need to step in and you need to get an attorney involved because that's about usually a lot of times that's the only way to get it resolved. They literally by law are not entitled to do this and they're not allowed by law to use gaining ownership of um, intellectual property as a, a way to enforce or to get not have a subcontract with a particular um, contractor. Next slide. Again, this goes right back in. This is, IP is a big issue from my perspective. Um, these are the two clauses that um, need to be in your contracts. Um, they need to be referenced and they need to be made very clear that this is what is going to govern your creation of intellectual property. Um, the note there, you can read that. I've already discussed this. Next slide. The second, kind of the other whole area of this, and we talk about the soup example, is your engineers, and, and by the way, they need to do this for a couple of reasons. With the prevailing use of open source software, and this is really an issue in software, more so than a lot of other areas, but almost every company and every commercial company out there now uses some forms of open source software, and you will see language in almost every subcontract dealing with open source software. And the fear is that some sort of open source software gets put into software in such a manner that it requires the entire software package to be put out publicly. This is something clearly DOD doesn't want, the prime contractors doesn't want, and I can say that most subcontractors also are not going to want. Um, so, when writing software, you need to make sure that you keep it being individual pieces of the vegetable soup and your engineers and your software people who are designing that stuff need to do the same thing. When we're talking about hardware, it's a lot easier to do plug and play stuff. And I always use the example of a car. I mean, I can look at a car and I can look at the components, say for example, of a of a car, if you ever look at a, a any kind of diagram of that, every single component is separately designed. So when you're doing something for the government and there's a lot of redesign on different things, it's a lot easier to keep the components separate. Um, but in software and intellectual property, a lot of times it's a lot harder to do so. And then also when you're doing drawings, if there's a piece of something you don't want the government to get any rights at all to and you're doing a drawing it's called black boxes you you have to give them form fit and function data for the black box but you actually don't have to give them anything else but that next slide a little bit of reiteration of this one too you only want to agree to provide the cost information that your accounting system can provide if you can't, if, if, if spreadsheets are awesome, and I know companies that still do their accounting on spreadsheets, 
nothing wrong with that per se. Um, but as you grow, as, and when you're a small company, you're five or ten people, there's no reason you can't do your time, you can't do this stuff on a spreadsheet. The problem with that then becomes is how do you put your time in? How do you get those time records? Again, it's something that could be done on a spreadsheet. Once you're past about 10 people, you're going to have to buy some sort of accounting program. And then it becomes a question of how you implement the accounting program. Are you going to implement it such that you can track and keep, keep specific cost information separate? Or is it going to become all more of a conglomerate where you're looking at more of the generally accepted accounting procedures to do your standard books? And you just have to take a look at that. Look at the size of the contract. If it's a small dollar contract, there's no real reason for you not to accept it as a firm fixed contract, assuming you know what your costs are or have an idea of what the costs are of doing this, because you can sell stuff at price. Next slide. Again, just because it's in their prime contract does not mean it needs to be in your subcontract. And I look at that constantly. And again, part of the problem is when you're dealing with a subcontract administrator, you're dealing with some people who are better than others. There is no question of that, right? There are going to be some people who are really, really good and understand exactly why clauses are flow down or what they, they are meaning when they flow them down. And then you're going to have other people that they have their little cookbook and good luck getting past them. I, I One of the things that I, I run into literally on a daily basis is talking with a, someone in subcontracts. They've been told the attorney will be on the call, but they never let their attorney know that there's going to be an attorney on the call. And their first comment is, is, well, we don't want to change that because if I change that, I have to go talk to legal. And I'm like, well, if our company can bring legal to the table, I think you can too. And more often than not, once legal starts talking, we're able to get to a resolution a lot faster because we at least understand what the different parties and what the different things are. The other big thing you hear about a lot with the flow downs, well, it's self-deleting. I wish at the time I had made note of the case, but there was a case that came out, and I want to say about 2010, 2011, it was, in fact, a state case between a prime contractor and a subcontractor in the GovCon space. One thing I have to say is, is that it was very obvious that this judge didn't even probably know how to spell defense contracting, but that was neither here nor there because the case itself was a state law case, which all subcontracts are going to be state law case. Some state laws are better than others. And the judge basically said, if it's, there is no such thing when I am looking at a contract and a contract dispute as a self-deleting clause. So the entire case hinged upon whether this particular clause was applicable to the instant um, contract or not. The subcontractor, I believe, was claiming that it was, it was applicable or what, I don't remember, but say it your way, but say that you're, you're claiming it's applicable and your prime contractor is claiming it's not applicable and your, your whole entire case is hinging upon the fact that it is a self-deleting clause. And now you are in a situation where you have some state judge and even worse, you have a jury basically making a decision whether something is self-deleting or not. And it's just not a good place to be in, honestly, from other side. And talking about state laws, as a subcontractor, California is wonderful. As a prime contractor, not so much. Um, the state law cases in California very, very, very heavily favor subcontractors. Next slide. Commerciality. If you have a product, and you can be, meet a requirement of having it become a commercial product instead of pages and pages of FAR and DFAR flowdowns, you will get maybe, actually, there's only five that are required by law to be flowed down. 
five. Um, there are others that are optional, but given the number of those, they're the kinds of things you guys shouldn't be doing anyway. They deal with bribery. They deal with procurement integrity and stuff like that. There's, a few, there's a, some other ones that have to. There's some unique ones that have to be slowed down if, for example, you're a subcontract. Um, your subcontract is working in a war zone. There's some contract that was more of an issue when we were in Afghanistan, but quite frankly, it's still an issue when you're dealing with somewhere in Iraq. Um, it's much, much easier to work as a commercial, provide a commercial product. I also have to point out that the FAR definition of a commercial product is different than the DFARS. And the big difference is under the FAR, if you sell to foreign countries, governments, that can be considered in whether or not something is being sold commercially under the FAR. It is not true under the DFARS. There's also been a definitional change um, for, that they've pulled out the difference between commercial product and commercial services. And they've made the definition of commercial services, I think, a little bit better. And they've, inc they've included more stuff than what uh, certain contractors and government agencies were trying to say were part of commercial pro services. Next slide. And that might be it. Up. Oh. Um, when you're looking at those pages and pages of FAR and DFAR clauses, if you have a FAR clause and there's a, there's a DFAR clause also, you need to have the FAR clause removed. And I shall point out that the clauses are all numbered the same, basically. So if you have a FAR, so for the FAR under the IP clause would be FAR 227, it would be 52.227 dash, I don't use these much, but I think there's would still be 7013. And then if you were under the DFARs, it's going to be 252.227 dash 7013. So the FAR clause should be removed from the contract and as much as anything else to remove a lot of inconsistencies and potential issues of conflict. There are also quite a few DOD deviation of FAR requirements. And those also, if you have a DOD deviation, that's going to be applicable to your contract as far as the federal government is concerned. But what goes into your contract actually is what's going to be applicable to you. And so there's some, FAR there's some DOD deviations of FAR requirements that are very, very useful to subcontractors. It's, I have no idea why DOD even bothered to do this, but they just issued a DOD deviation. I, I mean, I don't know how many of you on this call have been trying to get into SAM and get any kind of a unique um, entity identifier like that, but it has been abysmal having this happen. And so, um, there's a, a, a DOD deviation that says you can submit your proposal without being in SAM, but you need to have your SAM stuff done. I think it's within five days of actually getting a contract award. I don't know why they think that that's going to get it moving faster. And so my original thought when I first saw it and glanced at it originally, I thought, oh, okay, that's going to go till next year. No, it expires next month. So basically it bought about four or five weeks. I'm sure that somebody at SAM went to DOD and said, oh, no, 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 we'll be all caught up and fixed up by next month. So you just need a short-term one. Personally, not holding my breath. Um, already talked about different definitions. So you need to, as part of reading the contract, you need to go and take a look at the definitions that are going to be applicable to your contract and make sure it fits with your requirements. And if they don't, you need to get them fixed. You need to change the clauses. And keep in mind, again, this is a commercial contract. So in theory, with the exception of certain mandatory flowdowns, everything should be negotiable. It's not, but it should be. Next. Um, DOD is at the forefront of cybersecurity. Um, the, the CMMC is going to eventually be live. They're now at version two. Um, the problem continues to be uh, that they just don't, they, they can't figure out what they want to train 
how they want to certify the people who are going to be doing the reviewers, and how they can do all this without costing a whole lot of money. And I think that's kind of the stumbling block at this point. But eventually, that is going to be live. Right now, many of you have probably accepted the certification requirements that are in. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to correct that. That's 252 204 7012, 7019, and 720. It's not 227. It's 701. It's, uh, it's 204, not 227. Can you tell I do a lot of IP stuff? Um, and failure to comply is, um, I mean, the Department of Justice can go after you for failure to comply if you've certified that you are actually compliant. So that is a big problem. As, as we're going forward. And it's something that every contractor by now that's in DOD that has any DOD information, and I'm going to say D any DOD information because almost all of it's going to follow into one of the requirements that is um, of controlled unclassified information. So we're talking DOD, it should be there. And yes, it should be 252-204-7012. 7019, 7020, we will get that fixed before it goes out to uh, everyone else. Next slide. Talked about state law. We've talked about California law. Um, choice of forum, a lot of people ask that question. That's where you must bring suit. So if you're in Virginia and you're dealing with a company in Wisconsin that they're the prime contractor, odds are they're going to want you to sue them in Wisconsin. And that's going to be expensive. So a lot of times you're better off maybe not having a choice of forum in there because that's where you have to go to have suit. It's also where they will sue you if there's a breach of contract. I talked very differently, very briefly about work for hire clauses. And essentially what that means is someone is paying you to do something for them and they own all the intellectual property that you create. And they are not supposed to happen if it's government funding. It certainly can, certainly a Lockheed Martin, if they're putting their IR&D money, then yes, they're gonna probably issue the contract as a work for hire contract. And that's fine if that's okay with you, with you as a subcontractor. Some other clauses, um, changes, termination, indemnification. So indemnification always requires three parties. There's the two parties to the contract and some other third party who feels like they've been injured. And so basically what happens is you step into the place of, say for example, if the prime contractor gets um, sued and you are a subcontractor and they feel that you caused whatever action that they're being sued for, they will tell you, you have to step into their place. Some things to watch out for in indemnification is, is that even though it's supposed to cover the cost of what you're paying to a third party, I frequently see language in these things where not only does the prime contractor want to continue to be a part of the suit, but they also want you to pay the full cost of that. And so basically you have then signed a contract that you are going to pay whatever it costs whatever cost the prime contractor incurs in fighting the suit. And in the end, the prime contractor may decide to settle the suit and the settlement of the suit may not even be in your best interest. So you really wanna be careful in some of the indemnification causes. Limitation of liability, it's pretty much what it is. It's the limitation of liability between the two parties. Insurance, be careful that the insurance levels are way higher than what you're carrying in insurance and look at whether it's worth it. Most of the time, the prime contractors are pretty agreeable about having the insurance level be where you are, what you've already purchased, unless you're just really, really below market. Conflict of interest. We're talking about personal conflict of interest or organizational conflict of interest. And I can actually talk a whole day on conflict of interest. And I, in fact, do, once again, for the Fed Pubs organization that I, I teach on. And there are some other clauses, but those are kind of the biggies. I think this might be my last slide. One more, maybe? Yep, that was it.
Thank you so much, Jody, for your perspective um, and all of your, your insights. Uh, we'll make sure to fix that one number for you. Um, and these slides will be available after today's webinar. Um, so you'll be able to go over all of the data that Archiza presented as well as Jody's points. Um, this recording will also be available on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next week. So this concludes the webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.